This is Weekly Woman by Jubilance for PMS. Welcome, Leslie Hope Holtoff, um, and welcome to the show. We're so excited to have you on Weekly Woman. Thank you. I'm proud to be here. Yeah. So where are you calling in from? So I am in Suffolk, Virginia, which is uh, southeastern Virginia. We actually border North Carolina, so not far from Virginia Beach, uh, not far from the Outer Banks. Oh, that's so lovely. Oh, so you've got like both of those like great places to vacation. Yeah, I love living here. And we can be up in the mountains to go skiing in two hours. I can be in D.C. in about three hours. Um, It's just a cool place on the coast to sort of you get a good taste of everything. That is cool. I lived in D.C. for four years during university. I loved it there. It's such a beautiful city. I also love D.C. It's so fun to go up there and visit. Oh my gosh, I miss all of those restaurants and just like all the museums that are free. I can't believe it's free. Yeah, it's it's an awesome place to be near. Yeah. Um, can you tell me what you've been up to in the pandemic? <laughs> Couple of things, actually. Um, so I had started writing a book. I mean, I feel like I started writing it decades ago. Um, and it was one of those things that got picked up and put down and picked up and put down. And actually, uh, during the pandemic, my oldest son or my youngest son was um, a junior, I guess, when things started. So he and I decided I, I had to keep him engaged. So I, his name is Hatteras, and I was like, we're going to call it Hatteras Hour. And so for two hours every day, we would work on a book. So we actually wrote and self-published a children's book. And then I was like, I just worked harder to write a book with him than I've even worked towards my own book. And that inspired me to really double down on the book that I've been working on, which is, is basically a memoir and it covers the first sort of 30 years of my life. But there's two really big events. Um, one of them is that I had a baby. I got pregnant at 15 and I had a baby at 16. Um, and then I got married really young. I think I was 22. And then I almost very quickly got divorced at 26. So the book really focuses on those two events, uh, how they changed my life, how they set me up for everything after that. Um, And then here recently, um, over the past, we'll call it six months or so, the book really took a different turn and really started focusing a little bit more on those challenges that I faced as a teen mom um, and what the options were and why they weren't options for me and how important I believe those options are for everyone to have. And it's a, a little bit a different turn. Um, and then, you know, here as the, be- the book is getting released, we're in such a, a strange climate here. Um, I just feel like I wake up every day and I'm just not sure what's happening. But, um, but as a woman, things are changing pretty quickly. And all of a sudden my book became a little bit more relevant. Um, and, and gave me, I hope, um, a place to speak from as somebody who went through some of these challenges and had to make some tough decisions. Yeah. And, and can you tell us the title of your book? We haven't heard that yet. It's called Not Mary, Not Row: The Survival Story of a Reluctant Teen Mom. Mm-hmm. Um, and I named it that because whenever you talk about unwed mothers, you know, you got the Virgin Mary, everybody knows that story. And then it always ends up being about Jane Roe. And there's very few stories in the middle there um, that are quite so drastic, right? So, you know, I certainly wasn't the Virgin Mary, but I certainly wasn't Jane Roe either. And it's a story about all of the people in the middle. Um, I think it's really easy to throw stones at faceless people and say, oh, well, I, you know, I'm against uh, this and that. And it's easy to do that when you can't put a face to the name. So my book was really like, hey, look, I'm just a regular girl. This was my story. Um, you know, and I just want people to understand sort of who I was, um, and how the decisions that I made or didn't make really affected everybody in my life and was not a one-time decision that was just like, okay, it continues to affect my life every single day, um, and my son's life. Um, so that's what the story is about. I just wanted to sort of put a face and a name to somebody who was a teenager, who was a, a pretty good teenager at that and, uh, was still faced with these decisions and, I just want people to have somebody else they can relate to somewhere in between some of the most drastic stories that we hear about. Yeah, I think that's wonderful because we definitely hear the like Virgin Mary idea. There's even that 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 show on that was on CW. It was yes, um, Jane I can't the Virgin. Either. Yes, it, it, it like she's like artificially inseminated, but that's the story that we get as the single mom, and mm-hmm. like that's not the story that we need told because there are so many, like you said, so many in between. Or we have like the MTV teen mom version, which is oh. definitely not 
like most oh. people's experiences because that is like totally dramatized and like crazy to watch on TV. Um, yeah. Can you give us a little <laughs> snippet of your story and what's what, what you're sure. talking about? I, um, I have just incredible parents who might, would have been married uh, for 50 years coming up. Uh, my dad passed away about five years ago, but mm -hmm. I had this incredible family. I was the oldest of three daughters. Um, and I still found myself uh, pregnant at 15. We went to church every Sunday. I was very religious, um, did not want to have a baby, did not um, decide one day that I was going to start sleeping with my boyfriend. It is just something that happened. I felt very ill-equipped for being in this situation to say yes or no. I felt very, I, I didn't know. I, I went to my school library and sat there with an encyclopedia to try to figure out what was happening to my body. Um, I didn't even really know that I'd had sex. My friends actually laughed at me when I recalled the story and they were like, oh my God, <laughs> you didn't have sex. That's so cute that you think that you did, you know? And so I was floored. I was shocked. I couldn't believe this was happening to my body. I couldn't believe that any of it. Um, mm -hmm. My parents were equally as shocked, um, but because we were, I had been brought up, I mean, I was in the youth group. Um, I was brought up religious. So abortion wasn't something that I thought was an option. I had been taught that it was wrong and it was murder. And so it wasn't something that I ever truly considered. Uh, and later, as I became more educated, I, I got a little angry that that wasn't something that anybody had a serious conversation with me about as an option. I was a 15 year old wow. kid who had no understanding of what it meant to have a child. Um, I mean, you know, there's the physical aspect, like, okay, this is what's going to happen in my body. And I mean, let me tell you, it was pretty terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, and then I sort of skipped the adult body part, right? Like most people mm -hmm. go through puberty and they love their body. And then later they might decide to have kids and they're like, oh man, I was so cute when I was 18. Like, no, that didn't happen to me. <laughs> like I went straight from barely through puberty to a post-pregnancy body. Mm -hmm. Nobody really talked to me about what that meant, you know? And then there's the psychological, I mean, my God, I'm, I'm currently 44 years old, I think. And there's <laughs> still, I've been, you know, in and out. I've, I've always, I'm a huge supporter of therapy and all these things, but I still struggle to deal with the fact that I'm 44. I have a son who just turned 28. Um, I was not equipped to be a good mom to him. Uh, I still struggle communicating with him. Um, it's, no, there was just absolutely no resources. There was nothing out there to say, Hey, Leslie, this is what's going to happen to your body. This is what's going to happen to your mind. This is what's going to happen to your future. These are what your choices are going to be, or probably what they're not going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just feeling a lot of things out for myself. I mean, my family didn't know where to turn. We didn't know what even happens with insurance. You know what I mean? Like it was just all these questions and there was just no resources. And of course it was so incredibly shameful. This is 1993. Um, we didn't know anybody else who had been through this or there wasn't Wow. To my knowledge, any hotline to call. I mean, it was just stumbling in the dark trying to figure it out. Um, and since then, I have just wanted to scream through the rooftops. Like, I want to help other people in this situation. I don't, there should be more resources. There should be more support. And there's just not. And, and even now, all these years later, there's still not that. Um, if I, I just tried it the other day, I was like, okay, let's just pretend like I was pregnant and I needed some help when I was a teenager. And you immediately get pushed to, things, these resources that look like they're helping, but ultimately they're very religious based and I'm not anti-religion in any way, but there should be some non-religious black and white, very simple. We're here to help you. And these are your options. Mm -hmm. Um, and that just, it doesn't seem to exist in most places. It certainly doesn't exist here. And on many fronts, um, we still lack general sex education. Um, and that is one thing that my book talks about is I was just taught you don't have sex. You don't have sex until you're married. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that you could and you shouldn't. It was that you just didn't. I didn't even really understand like what it was. Choice, right. I didn't know that that's what they meant. I didn't know that I could if I wanted to, but I shouldn't, you know, it was just, you don't. And so mm -hmm. I didn't even, I get really angry when, when we're taught as girls that sex is something that's taken from us, that it's something that if we do have sex before marriage. Um, clearly we've been sort of bamboozled, right? We've been talking <laughs> to something that, that I wasn't smart enough to understand or say no, or I wasn't strong enough. And that we're just taught that sex is something for men from us. Mm -hmm. I was never, ever told that sex could be something one day that I would enjoy, that I might want, that I might get pleasure out of, that I might like. Mm -hmm. um, I was just never taught that. And then all of a sudden, 
you're a girl and you're taught don't do it and it's shameful if you do and all of these things and then you get married and it's like now you should love it every day now you should <laughs> want to do it and now you should feel comfortable in your body that you've been taught to hide all these years and it just doesn't make sense we're just we're doing it wrong <laughs> you know and yeah. I, I don't have an answer on how to change that but sex education is certainly Definitely. I mean, I, I am 10 years younger than you, but still I grew up in the California school system, super, super liberal. Um, mm -hmm. but I didn't even have health class. My health class was, I took dance instead of PE. So our health class option that we could take was through, uh, Brigham Young university. So the Mormon, uh, church and it, it had nothing about sex in it, nothing. So basically I learned sex education from my girlfriends in college because they were like, what the hell? You haven't learned about this? This is bad, Alice. Yeah. And so they had to teach me themselves about what this thing was. Mm -hmm. um, but it just shows like the lack of education that we have in California, Virginia, anywhere right. in the United States, we're just not taught about what this thing is. We're not, and we're also even taught not to talk about it. And I mean, I know in my house, I wasn't allowed to watch rated R movies or movies, <laughs> you know, so I literally had nothing. I was like, okay, I think I understand kissing now, but like, that was it. And it just is awful, the things. And then again, in health class, we are, of course, and that's very important too, but it was more like, these are your ovaries and this is a fallopian tube. And it was very scientific. And this is how kids are made, but nobody put the pieces together. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, for example, like how old was I when I found out that you had sex for pleasure, you know, a million times in your life and only to procreate maybe once to three times. Like mm -hmm. it's just not addressed. It's just not talked about. And then all of a sudden you're just supposed to know. And of course, back in the early nineties, I didn't have the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a whole different problem now. If that's where we're teaching kids, you know, we've gone from <laughs> no access except for the encyclopedia to what is way too much access and we're still not having these conversations and you know i thankfully have tried really hard with my kids to have those uncomfortable conversations you know and i've tried really hard to teach them that you know if you want to wait till marriage that's good for you but if you don't that's okay for you too like this is your life and your decisions and i i want to you know tell you to be educated about it and this is how it happens and I've tried to be a little bit more open with them and they're boys. So I think that's helpful, but um, yeah. it's, still, it's just something we're not doing right. And it is, um, I believe our daughters that are paying the price. And, you know, as a, someone who's been divorced and I'm remarried and, you know, when you have a problem in your marriage, that's like the first thing they ask, are you guys having sex? Yeah. Like, how's the sex life going? It's <laughs> so indicative often of a healthy relationship. It's some would say the most important part of a healthy relationship we don't teach anybody that you know? we just don't teach anybody that. And then you just are trying to figure it out and you don't know how to talk about it because nobody talked about it with you. And now you're supposed to talk about it with your husband. And I'm like, this is crazy. This is just conversation. This is a problem that can be solved with conversation. Yeah. Um, and a conversation not, that, that everyone should be having like throughout the centuries, we've all been having sex to like, to create more people forever. <laughs> But we're then, literally all only here because somebody else had sex. Yeah, but what's so exciting is like the idea of like having sex for pleasure too now, which wasn't an option 50 years ago. And now, which is um, kind of changing again with Roe v. Wade um, yes. in, in what we have access to. Can you talk a little bit about your reaction to uh, the dismantling of uh, that that well, as I said before, I mean, abortion was was legal, um, but I I had just been taught it wasn't an option, mm -hmm. and I feel like I'm one of those rare people that I had this baby, and it makes me really angry when I talk to other people who had kids out of wedlock or as teenagers or whatever, you know, and they're like, oh my god, my kid is is my best friend, and it was the greatest gift, and I'm like, okay, good for you. That's not what it was for me. Had I truly understood my options, that probably would have been the best option for me. Um, I mean, I had a kid, I turned 16 in May and he was born on July 4th. I was barely 16 years old. Um, I was a lucky one, right? Because I had two parents who, you know, we, we cried every day for nine months, but at least, you know, they didn't kick me out and they did help me figure out how to get insurance and they mm -hmm. 
went with me to the pediatrician's office and they really supported me. Um, and I was really lucky, but when I found out I, I have boys, but all my friends have girls and I have these just little girls and they're, they're nine and they're 10 and they're six and they're three. And they're little girls that I spend time with every weekend and I love them. And they're my nieces and my best friend's kids and their faces showed up in my mind. And I mean, I was just frozen. Like I would never wish what happened to me on anyone because even though I was lucky, I was not lucky. Mm -hmm. I was not lucky. What was, you know, the decision that was, again, I guess I made it, but I was a 15 year old girl making a decision based on like 10% of, of the actual information that was facts, you know, or, or mm -hmm. what the consequences would be. So I don't really feel like I did make a decision. And um, it, like I said, it changed the rest of my life. It is a life sentence. It is a life sentence. Um, you're a mom for the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, and your needs become secondary, but long before my needs ever became primary, I lost the ability to have that. And every decision that I made for decades still, right, is based on my kids. Mm -hmm. um, this is where I have to live because this is the best school system and this is where I've got to get a house and this is the job that I want to get. And I want to get that job because it pays more money, but I'd have to work more hours and I can't do that because I got to pay for daycare. And, you know, it's just, it's this cycle that you can't, you can't get out of. Mm -hmm. And so when I heard about, well, I mean, the re reaction when it got leaked was, you know, that was probably the big whammy. And then I was kind of expecting it, but even though I was expecting it, it's, it was one of those moments where I'll always know exactly where I was when I found out. And all I could think about were these girls. Um, and it's crazy. Like when I was a, a quote unquote little girl, girls started their period around 12 years old. And now girls are starting their period at like nine. Yeah. I, I know of people and their daughters are going through this at nine and 10 years old. And it's just sort of like, oh my God, that is so heavy, you know? And, and the science behind that is a whole different thing to talk about. But the bottom line is, how can anyone think that a, a 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, I mean, you know, you get to 16, 17, you start having a little bit more but you don't have that. You do not have the mental capacity to understand, to even say yes to sex, right? So even under any circumstances, if you get pregnant at those ages, it's not something that you understood what you were doing and made a choice. And so you've got these girls who, when they find themselves and it's nobody's business, whether it's a boy that they like who's older or a boy that's the same age or their stepdad or their dad, it's nobody's business how they got in this situation, it shouldn't be. It should be our business, what we can do to help these kids be able to have a shot at having a real life. Mm -hmm. And we've taken that off the plate in, in many states. Um, and I'm terrified that that number will grow. And of course, being able to go to a different state is better than not being able to go to any state. But it, it of course, it's you know limited to people who have that ability. Yeah, it's- As we talked about, no 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 year old girl is driving herself to another yeah. state. Um, and I, who, who are they supposed to talk to? Who, who are you supposed to talk to? I yeah. mean, it's great that you have great parents, but even great parents, as we just discussed, don't know what to do in this situation. They don't know where to go. They don't know who to talk to. They may not have the resources to help you. I mean, and we've just, we're, we're making it hard for kids that we're supposed to be looking out for. And, oh my God, oh my God. And then you're, they're not going to be born. You're not going to have kids. These kids are not going to have kids and be great parents. Mm -hmm. They haven't even seen enough of parenting from their own parents to be able to mimic it. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and obviously I feel the same way about anyone who is pregnant and doesn't want to be, whether you already have five kids, whether you're married, whether you're 25, I feel that way, but I personally have, you know, you have having gone through it at such a young age. That's my passion. I just watching us turn kids into moms is just a nightmare. I mean, I call myself a reluctant mom because I was a reluctant mom. I didn't want to be a mom. I did not want to be a mom. Um, I was never even the kind of mom that loved being a mom later when I chose to be a mom. <laughs> you know, like I'm still not, you know, like I, I love my kids and, um, but I'm still just not a mom's mom. You know, I, I, I'm not the mom who, who did extravagant <laughs> birthday cakes and couldn't wait to throw birthday parties. I was like, man, it's another birthday party. All right, we're going to do it. And you know, like, 
I, I am. I'm, I'm a reluctant mom all the way through and through. Um, and just to not have that choice is it, awful. It's awful. And you just don't get over it. And it's amazing that you're able to to write this book and to have have something that like kind of sheds light on this really taboo subject. Um, have you been able to discuss this your whole life? Have you been have you been talking about your life, or is this the first time that you're starting to open up and share about your? It's story? the first time I'm talking about it publicly. I mean, it took me. I remember the first time I I told the story um, of getting pregnant, telling my parents. And the first time I told it and I was able to tell it without crying, like it was so traumatic to me that it took me years to be able to talk about. And I'm talking at least a decade. And then after that, to be able to talk about it where it didn't put me in such a spiral that I would not be able to recover. For example, for years, if I was say having some beers with my friends and it came up, I would break out in this red thing. Like I looked like a tomato wow. and it was just like a stress response. And, and I would have to just like leave and go to bed. Like I couldn't get out of it. It would look like I was having an allergic reaction. It took me so long to be able to just talk about it without it physically making me worthless. Like it would take so much energy out of me that I just would have to like go lay down. I, I couldn't even tell the story because it was that traumatic to me and that upsetting. Like I've never like, you know, you're like, oh, hi, I'm Leslie. It's nice to meet you. And, and, and as a woman, it's like, oh my God, are you married? Do you have kids? Yeah. I've never been the questions. I don't start that conversation. I'm never one that's like, oh my God, do you have kids? Because I know you're going to ask me if I have kids. And that's I don't want to answer because the second question is how old are they? And yeah. as soon as I say that my kid is however old, you're going to start doing math. And you're going to be like, she doesn't look old enough to have a kid that age. And it's just like, wow. And I'll say, Oh, let me save you the time. I was 16, you know, like, mm -hmm. it, you know, I hated it. I mean, this is not a conversation you want to have in job interviews. It's not a conversation you want to have when, when you're in college and it's not the conversation you want. It's never a good time to have that conversation. And that's not a good but, conversation that men get asked either. Like, Oh, are you married? Do you have children? No, that's not the conversation that they're having when you first meet someone. No. And you know, I, have, I mean, my kids are two different dads and that's a something I'm not proud of, but it's something that you have to talk about. And because it's like, oh, well, you had a kid in high school. Well, did you marry him? Like, no, I married someone else. And then I had another kid and then I got divorced and it's like, okay, well, within three seconds, you know, like the worst three things about me, yeah. <laughs> you know, with no context and no storyline and, and, you know, and we live in America and people mm -hmm. immediately judge you for these things. And I've had to fight that judgment my entire life. And I fought it in ways that only make sense to me. Um, you know, like for whatever reason, I started off thinking I couldn't have a college degree. And then it was, I can have one, but I'm gonna have to work harder than everybody else, which was true. I didn't get to live in a dorm and I didn't get to have college parties and I didn't get to do any of that stuff. And I did not get my bachelor's degree until I was, I think I was 32. Um, but to me, that was the hardest thing that I had to work for. It was homework at 5 a.m. and it was online classes and night classes and begging people to help me with the kids. And it was hard, right? And so now I'm super proud of myself, but also when I'm like, when somebody says, oh, where did you go to college? I'm like, oh, I went to, I went to ODU. And, and you know, the story stops, right? Everyone just assumes, oh, well, she probably graduated at 18 and she went to college and four mm -hmm. years later, she walked out with a degree. And I don't get to say, no, it was really, really hard. It was something that I fought for. It was something I fought against. You know, there were people that were like, what do you even need this for? You know, like you already have a job and two kids. Isn't this too much to take on? Like, no. And I was just like, I've got to find something to, to counter the first half of my story, right? I need my second story to be amazing. And for me, that meant proving that I could was smart enough to get this education like so many other people do without even thinking about it. And so and also telling your story too, especially when the world needs to hear it the most. Yes. Um, I, I think that is an amazing part of your story that you're able to help so many people just by telling, like talking about this taboo thing. Yes. Yes. It's, and, and it's just conversation. It's like, you know, we have so many, I now have a master's degree in public policy and I'm working on my PhD. Oh and my God. Thank you. Thank you. I'm super excited. And, and there's so many, you know, public policy is hard. There are so many solutions that cost so much money and you've got to figure out how they're going to be funded. And it's like, 
this isn't one of those things. This is something that can be so much better based on conversation. Our kids are already going to school and we already have health classes. What if we told them the truth? You know, like what if we stopped pretending like abstinence was an incredible, easy thing to do and it was the only way? I mean, I don't know. What if we talked to them like sex was an important part of relationships and we really helped them focus on how beautiful it can be, but also how bad it can be and just give them facts, um, you know, because we don't safely. Yeah, we don't arm them with anything. And then when they do get pregnant, it's like, oof. okay, you weren't adult enough to know the truth about sex. But now that you are an adult, why don't you decide if you want to have a baby or not? Mm -hmm. Great. How are you going to go to school? What religion is that baby going to be? Is it going to get, um, you know, baptized? You know, are you going to marry the dad? We know you don't even really like him. You know, I mean, you went through this horrible sex experience. You yeah. know, you've got <laughs> serious traumatic uh, responses, but, you know, I guess you got to marry him. I know you're only 15 mm -hmm. and the rest of your life could be 75 years, but hey, that makes perfect sense. You know, like it, it just is like, it's just conversation. Um, mm -hmm. And, and it's more than just talking to kids. It's as adults, I, I wish my, I saw my parents' friends' reaction and they had friends that didn't really want anything to do with them anymore. And they wow. had friends who were, you know, we love you, we love Leslie, what can we do to help? Like, it was just, we need to support the parents. You know, the parents, having a daughter that gets pregnant doesn't mean that you failed as a parent. Turning your back on them means you failed as a parent. Like, that's it. Um, we need to give them the resources to support their daughters. I mean, obviously sex education, there's so many ways we can get ahead of this. So nobody has to have conversations about pregnant teenagers. Uh, and that's step one. And then step two is when you do have these kids, let's just talk to them, you know, and let's talk to the parents and let's get them the resources they need. You, we don't have to use this as an opportunity to turn them into Christians. You know, we can just use it as an opportunity for them to understand what's going on with their body, mm -hmm. what their choices are and help them. Yeah. And, help them. and I'm all, you know, and I'm all for adoption, but that it is just not that simple. Um, I wish that it was, that would be a beautiful little box. We could tie a bow on and be like, this is a great solution. Yeah. It's not, it's not always a great solution. It is a beautiful thing for some people. Um, but it, it's just not for, it's just not for everyone. Mm -hmm. And when does your book come out, Leslie? When can we all, when, when and where can we get your book? <laughs> um, September 20th is when it comes out. You can buy the ebook. Uh, you can pre-order the ebook now. And I hope to have uh, hardback and paperback available any day now. Um, but again, they will be released on September 20th. Um, I'm really excited to be able to tell my story. And I hope that it will just be of comfort for somebody out there. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And one thing that we always ask on this podcast is what is your definition of womanhood? Oof. That's a really good question. Um, the term gets broader the more and more I learn about womanhood. Um, but I think it's, you know, we're putting a position where that's a really good question. You know, I think it changes moment to moment of someone's life, which is why I think it's so interesting because everyone has a different idea about what it is. And like each second it changes in your head. So I think this is your definition at this moment on Wednesday, July 6th at 2.25. Uh, I think at this moment, womanhood to me is, you know, roughly half of the population right now has to come together and fight for our rights to be moms if we want to be moms, to not be moms if we don't want to be moms, that our bodies are not vessels uh, to be used, um, to be used and tossed around lightly. Um, and I think that womanhood is at, right now, at this second, absolutely anybody who wants to fight for or against that right. Um, period. Period. Yeah. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, it was such a pleasure to get to talk to you today. Um, do you want to add anything else to our listeners? Whew, I don't think so. I know I just, I just went on a little bit of a couple rants. That's I'm happy. Great. To have the I love it. I'm happy to have the opportunity. I just, you know, this is such a weird time that we're in, and I hope that everyone out there um, that we can come together. I also started a nonprofit. I'm in the process of starting a nonprofit to just get those resources together. I mean, for parents, when you find yourself with your, your child, 
boy or girl um, in this situation to help you try to have the resources you need to make some educated decisions, uh, resources for, for teenagers in this situation. Um, so I'm working to do that. And I hope that, you know, obviously there's Planned Parenthood and there's all these other resources that are out there to try to help you. And I encourage people to do the research and find them and to come together um, in womanhood and humanhood yeah. <laughs> for everybody that it affects right now. And, and let's, let's figure out a way to, to just love each other and get through this. Thank you so much, Leslie. And again, for everyone listening, her book comes out September 20th and you can pre-order it now. Not Mary, Not Row, The Survival Story of a Reluctant Teen Mom. Thank you so much, Leslie. Thank you.